The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so uh, that was light fields, and we're going to switch topics a little bit. Um, we saw, you know, if you think about light fields, you can build really cool like CI devices. You know, if you have a camera array, uh, you can do all kinds of crazy things. Like, you can, of course, you can do refocusing and see through occluders. Um, but you can do also other things. Like, if I have a light field camera, let's say this one, uh, and which is interesting, there's actually a camera here. <laughs> we'll be talking about that. Anyway, if this was an array of cameras uh, and you shake it, you know, you have image stabilization problems, typically. But if you have a light field camera, then, uh, okay, if you want to stabilize the image, then you have multiple opportunities, multiple solutions. You can either put, you know, big mechanical rigs so that they stabilize your motion to get rid of uh, a camera shake, or you can put some optical stabilization techniques to you know, dampen out the effects uh, and so on. But if you have, sorry. For taking many pictures, but they're doing all right. No, but it's a video. Oh, video, right? Yeah, this is a video. Cool. So you know, there is uh, Schwarzenegger and he's jumping in his in his uh, truck and there's a camera moving and it's following. How do you keep the camera stabilized? Although it's being shot in a very rough terrain, right? That's the classic video stabilization. Maybe that's what, I, I should say video stabilization, not image stabilization. Um, but if you have a light field camera, then you can let it shake uh, and create a very smooth video out of that. How would you do it? Remember, there's a 5 by 5 camera array. And I'm going to shake it, but I want to create an illusion as if there was a single camera that's traveling through this space in a very slow manner. Yes? So in a sense, the light the camera captures a bunch of people's time. Uh -huh. So what you can do is take two frames of right. the video and try to find the light, the light point. That right. Is the exactly. Point, which is the That's it. Right. As simple as that. You have 25 cameras, and you sh you in the very next frame it was shaken. So the camera from which we are shooting the let's say the center of the five by five is your actual camera, but in the next frame. That may be too jerky, but some other camera took its place in a straight line. So you can just switch between different cameras and find the camera that looks like it's going in a straight line. Yes? But then can you switch, you'll see the wearables like... Yes, yes. So you have to do a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. You have to do a little bit more. But that's as opposed to doing traditional video stabilization where you have to shift an image and you know do some warping or something. Here you get very nice clear views. So there was a, this was... Um, uh, ICCV paper this year, 2009, um, International Conference on Computer Vision. This simple idea. Take 25 cameras and create a stabilized view. Because the way things are going, 25 cameras are going to be much cheaper than buying a video stabilization trick. I mean, again, it's a dollar right now, under a dollar actually, a camera. So you can imagine in the future, your uh, phone has 25 cameras on the other side. And you, know, you can do anything you want. Uh, and from that, you can create all these effects. And you can do stabilization and as we see many other things. You can be able to do gestures with it. Come back soon. Yeah. Really interesting things are going to happen. So, and we'll be at the forefront of that. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, cameras, cameras looking at people, cameras looking at fingers, um, you know, how uh, when you have camera, how we can think about complexity of emitters and receivers, um, and uh, motion capture. Right? These are all classic problems in, in cameras for XCI. And this is a chart we saw early in the, that's great, thanks. Uh, we saw early in the class about um, what are some SCI projects that are actually boring. Uh, because in the field of SCI and the field of cameras and multimedia is not that new anymore. Uh, and so you have to be very careful, you know, when 
uh, even at Media Lab, where a lot of great things were invented uh, in the 90s, um, back then very few people did you know, this kind of SCI. So anything you do is likely to be new. You don't have to worry about it. You just start the project and you work on it and it's pretty much guaranteed that what you're doing is brand new. But that's not the case anymore. Everybody has access to these technologies and, and computing power and so on. And if you just start a HCI project, it's very less likely that what you're doing is actually new. Uh, so you know you have to expose yourself by going to events and seeing what other people are doing, and and so on. You know maybe your technology is new, but your application is not new. Maybe your application is new, but the technology is not new. And you have to just have the right mix uh, of uh, of all of that to be really impressive. So you know always remember this. You can, you know, you cannot impress all the people all the time. And uh, I just gave a talk to um, uh, the, the the first year RA class. I guess I guess you were there during that class. And uh, one of the things I mentioned was that for HCI, it's it's very kind of tempting to work on HCI projects because you know you get instant gratification first of all, uh, and second. Uh, especially if you're at a place like MIT or Media Lab, you get a lot of press. And people look at it and say, wow, cool, it's, it's so interesting, I wish I had it, and so on. Um, and that is good, any positive reinforcement is good, but it's also very detrimental in the long run, because if what you're doing is not really new or impactful, um, then you get this positive reinforcement because the press says it's interesting, and people who come and see your demo say it's interesting, you think, wow, this is exactly what I should be doing, but be careful. You know, you know, talk to people, try to publish it, try to expose yourself, and subject yourself to some some you know peer reviews, and then see if it's you know still worth doing it. So submit to conferences, high level conferences, not the ones that are organized by your friends or or you know former colleagues. Uh, high level conferences, and, and just go to those events and see what's going on. So that's kind of my high level advice for doing HCI. Uh, and what we're going to do is a relatively quick run through of, uh, of several technologies, but you know, you're very welcome to explore an HCI uh, demo as your final project. It's always fun. I, I mean, I personally love seeing really cool interaction uh, devices, but again, the field is saturated and you have to make sure you're doing uh, the most interesting things. Okay. So by HCI, I'm, I, I'm mainly going to focus on uh, device-oriented HCI, and I will not be talking about you know, traditional cameras uh, and uh, HCI done with that. So probably the most classic example of uh, camera-based HCI is you know, interaction with touch screens. Um, and the classic project from Rekimoto, now almost 10, 15 years old, uh, is um, you have a projector that's projecting on the screen, like here. Uh, you have an IR camera uh, that's looking at the screen, and then you have some lights that are illuminating the scene. If your hand is very far away from the screen, it is, does not reflect light back. But if your hand is sufficiently close to the to the uh, rear projection screen, then it will reflect light back uh, to the camera. And because the projector is working in the visible spectrum and the cameras working in the near IR spectrum, uh, they don't interfere with each other, and then you can uh, recognize uh, the picture of the, the output, recognize the blobs, and from that you can figure out. Uh, very beautiful, very classic, but you know, at this stage, not worth, not worth pursuing. It's too much has been done in this space. If you want to build a product, maybe, but if you want to do research, you know, don't follow this path uh, too much. Um, some some other interesting thing. This was done, I believe, by 99. Yeah, 99. Uh, uh, as you know, this uh, uh, a mouse is the camera in a mouse is one of the largest markets for image sensors. If you remember the chart in the beginning of the class, you know about 100, 300, about 300 million. I think I believe sensors are sold uh, in in mouse, which is amazing, and it's actually. A camera that's very low resolution, about 20 pixels by 20 pixels, and it's running at very high frame rate, close to 1,000 frames per second. Uh, and all it's doing is looking at optical flow. If 
you take an image at one instant versus the next instant, is anything changing? And that's why you can work it. You don't have to have it on a rough surface like you used to have with those uh, spinning uh, spinning balls. Um, you can use it on a, on a smooth surface as long as there is texture. If you put it on a completely white piece of paper that has no texture, this will not work because it's looking at uh, image differencing, frame to frame difference. And it has everything embedded in it. It's taking the two pictures. I mean, it's taking a video rate picture. It has uh, a DSP that's doing this optical flow comparison to basically get this 2D vector. Are you moving? What's the X vector and what's the Y vector? That's it. Uh, and of course, you know, you can buy optical mouse for one. Just tens of dollars now. What's the cheapest one? But really, really cheap, right? Sorry? Ten dollars. Okay, yeah. Um, and then this group uh, at, uh, at Microsoft, Ken Hinckley and others, said, okay, what if you, this is only two degrees of freedom. Can you add other, other four degrees of freedom? So rotation, right now rotation is not, not, not covered because the image will not change if you stay in one place, uh, but also able to lift it and, and tilt it just from the, from the mass. So, you know, they just placed a, um, a surface on which you can, you can pivot. Uh, and then the grid itself was uh, this array of dots, which you can see in a, in a grid form. Um, and that the distortion of that uh, tells you, you know, if you're if you're head up, then all the all the disks will look the same shape. If you tilt it one way or the other, you'll get some keystone distortion. Uh, and in addition, they placed these markers within each disk to get absolute position. And then between the between these uh, uh, fiducials, they can get the relative position. So it's a pretty clever idea. Uh, slightly difficult to implement because this all has to run in real time. And uh, if you have a printed pattern like that, you know you must have a mouse pad of that shape. And people like, just like to have it completely free. Nowadays, the mouse should not have any constraints on where it is sitting. All right. Uh, then uh, FTIR, which has become really popular now, uh, frustrated total internal reflections. Um, and let me show the show the demo first, and then uh, see how this goes. So this is uh, Jeff Hans' demo from 2005, uh, and FTIR is used in many other fields. So FTIR itself is not new, but the way it's used for uh, touch interaction is is really beautiful here. Okay, so how does this work? Right? You have an LED uh, that's uh, emitting light, um, and if the refractive index of the glass is sufficiently different from air, so the air is one, the glass is about 1.5, and if the light is hitting the, this uh, interface between glass and air at a sufficiently steep angle, uh, it's going to continuously uh, reflect within the uh, bounds of this glass, okay? Um, and that's exactly how uh, all these other technologies work as well. So fiber optics, uh, light pipes, and, and all these things also work on this basic principle. So in the case of fiber optics, you have, in the simplest case, you just have uh, a glass pipe constant uh, homogeneities, this air, this glass, and you have some kind of coupling, you have a laser, uh, light goes in. If it goes at the right angle, it will just reflect back and forth, and it will be transmitted over thousands of kilometers this way, without significant attenuation. Uh, and, but if you hit it at a, at a wrong angle, it will just go out. So it will refract. But at a sufficient steep angle, it will propagate. Um, and of course, the modern fibers are not uh, single clad but multi clad They have, uh, have air and N1 and N2. And and uh, so, light goes in, it refracts, reflects, uh, goes in, refracts, reflects, and so on. So, by creating different index of uh, refraction, you basically start getting some kind of mystery as opposed to pure magnetic. 
and the square the losses are reduced to uniform. Okay, because you just have um, class and air, uh, some amount of light will actually lead to and it's given by uh, the coefficient. The ratio of this, uh, the absolute numbers and the ratios of this refractive index will tell you how much of the light will actually lead to over four percent. So it's not a coefficient. But if you use this gradient index, then it turns out everything will stay within the bottom. Or, or Uh, light pipes work the same way, like instead of projector, you might have a have a bulb, but the actual images, uh, LCD or DMD is pretty far away, so they use light pipes to guide light in a very similar fashion, uh, and so on. So this is, you know, for low light, low light transmission, the idea of uh, FDIR is very, very well known. Um, sorry, that's total internal reflection, not a frustrated total internal. So this is just sequence of total internal reflection, and now what you want to do is frustrate the internal reflection and let the light leak through. Um, and in this case, at the interface between the glass and air, if you um, um, allow the light to escape uh, somehow, so you can put a finger here, or if you just put some dust particles here. On the fiber, if you just put through dust particles, your uh, light will try to reflect. But because of the diffusion here, it will also go up. <coughs> and it's the same principle that you may have seen in uh, some of the menus that they have at restaurants or in movies. They have this uh, this uh, glass slabs. So they'll have a slab like this. Okay. And there will be lights at the top, or just a pipe. Uh, and then when there is, when it's just clear glass, you just see through it. Uh, but you can just take chalk or any, any simple marker, and you can write on it, and it starts starts to glow. That's again because light is trapped within this guy, and it just goes away. Uh, but when you put some uh, pigment on it, light reflect, uh, does internal reflection. At the end, it gets diffused, and it comes out. Everybody can of this. Many restaurants will have their menu written which is the same exact principle of frustrating at some stage the total internal reflection. Uh, there's even a company called uh, Wedge Display that built a, um, a TV that's uh, based on this principle. And the way that works is You can probably uh, look up uh, the wedge display. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, wedge display. I got it. Um, yeah. Do you know about wedge display? Sorry? Do you know about wedge display? No, no, never. Okay. It's, it's fun. It's really a cool, cool idea. So, let's say you have a projector from which you want to create a big flat screen TV. Okay. Typically, when you have a projector, there are a couple of solutions. You, know, you can do it this way, or you can put some mirrors to create a real projection TV. But this company in the UK came up with a very clever idea where you have a wedge on glass. <laughs> and then you have a projector and it projects the light uh, inside. And the top of pixel here will uh, you know, go at a steep angle and they put a film here. So actually they don't. And the angle between this wedge okay, is chosen in such a way that if you shoot a ray at, at a particular position, it will reflect, 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 but eventually the angle will not be sh uh, sh uh, shallow enough so that the light will actually come out. Okay. So the total reflection doesn't, uh, if, it, if it was a, a, a straight pipe, if it comes in, it will maintain that angle forever. But when it's a wedge, eventually it will trap out. And if you if you shoot some other angle, it will come out right away. So you might have projected a tiny image here, it will reflect and it will end up creating this nice 15 inch wide uh, image. A very beautiful product. Uh, they just I believe they got acquired by Microsoft. 
Microsoft surface team.
I think they're one of the best in modern displays. Okay, so how do we use it for how do you use it for uh, uh, for SCI? Again, the same principle. Uh, we're going to uh, you know do the simple reflection. In this case, instead of a diffuser, we're going to use a finger, and the finger is going to prevent it from doing pure internal reflection, and will also diff start diffusing light on the other side. Uh, and then in this case, you can just put a, a, a a scatterer so that this is like to go in every direction. So, which way is the projector here? So this is only for capture. There's a camera down here that's looking at the scatter light. And there's a projector as well like that that's projecting light on this diffuser. Okay. So in this case, the finger is on the right and the camera and projector are on the left. Oxygen. Only 2005. That's when the paper came out. But 2007, 2008, it was already a company. It was a big hit during the, the elections in 2008. CNN was using his product. Uh, all started with a paper in a high quality conference. So that's how it works. You have scattered light, project on the camera, and then only where you have physical contact, you see very bright points. If you remove it, if you, if you hover it over the, the glass, you will see. This is, again, the same principle where you provide a menu on this of glass. Uh, you may also have seen this effect in sheets of water. Uh, there's this really cool trick you can do where uh, you you have droplets of water uh, and then you shine an LED into that and the light travels through it. So if you see from, from this side, it looks completely transparent. But if you break the beam by putting your hand or, or uh, wind or anything like that, the light comes out. Okay. So one kind of uh, uh, disadvantage of this particular scheme is that you need to have sufficient separation between the screen and the projector camera, right? Because it's, it's looking at this it needs sufficient uh, area to, to create this, uh, this, this. You could do like a real projection TV and for the path and so on. But nevertheless, it's not as convenient if you want to build this on a laptop or a mobile display. So that's why this project started, the wider screen, where you, you might be able to create that in a completely the same uh, display. So let's go over that. Uh, there's some recent projects. Uh, this group at uh, Microsoft, Shahram Zaudi and others, they're building uh, FTIR mocks, where you just have an acrylic uh, uh, curved piece of glass and uh, and there's a camera up here that's looking at the gestures on, on top of it. And it's the same effect. Sorry? got the best paper uh, Did they get it? It was just presented uh, a couple of weeks ago. Just two weeks ago. Oh, it's sir. Beautiful. So, yeah, this is still hot talk. Where was that? Uh, UIST, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. User interface. The same place where Jeff Hahn this thing for you. And the same paper uh, also talks about a side mouse where uh, it's not really, you, can't, you can see the two fingers here, just barely, and the two fingers here. What they're doing is they're creating a, a sheet of light that's traveling almost parallel to the table. So if, if I put my finger, uh, only the bottom part of my fingers will be lit up. Uh, and it's looking at how the light is being uh, obstructed by the fingers. And, and there's a camera that's just looking straight at it. But most of these pixels are wasted. And all these bottom pixels uh, are being used. But this is actually only 1D sensing. It's only 1D sensing, that's right. Sorry. Sort uh, of, but I think they they can tell how far away your fingers are based on the 
the size of the okay. brains of the... Okay. I think we just group the camera yeah. for some triangulation. But don't want to keep it cheap. Um, and this, this principle of having a sheet of light and seeing where you cut it, where you obstruct it, is, is, is used in, in many, other, uh, uh, many other projects. So uh, if you remember, there was a um, Canesta projector where they wanted to create a, a keyboard anywhere in, in space. So all they had was a, a canister projector which projects a keyboard pattern out here. And then at the bottom, again, they had a sheet of light that goes out the same way. So the sheet of light kind of goes here like that. Uh, and then the camera, so when you put your fingers on it, it gets blocked. But because the projector is also projecting the keyboard here, you know exactly where you're touching. So it's kind of a a keyboard or a bookman. So again, this is a projector, <coughs> camera, and a laser sheet. And because it's a slight projector, it's very cheap. It's just projecting the keyboard. Right? Um, and then those big smart board displays you may have seen uh, have also a very similar structure. You have uh, the big board, and there's a a little bit of a baffle, and the corner of this um, screen, there are cameras that are looking out. Um, and these cameras are actually mostly 1D, they're looking at something that's close to the screen. Uh, and then they're illuminating the whole board with a, a near IR sheet again. So when you put your finger, uh, one or more of these cameras will see where you're touching with your finger or with your hand. And they match you different colors. Uh, and the bunch of angulation they can figure out and you are not free to just do. So this is a huge number, I don't know, 100 million, 200 million dollars in sales. Smart board. The products are really good. So the, the, the board that's in Pakistan is kind of smart board. It's, it's expensive. Anyway, this is this is very popular in many offices. The, the aim is to put this in every classroom of K through twelve so that learning can be practical. And of course, all these uh, displays will have uh, projected light on. So you have a projector that's projecting on the whiteboard, and then you can drive. All right. And then, of course, you are uh, familiar with uh, the V-Mode, which was quite revolutionary because it placed a camera in the remote control. So the V-Mode actually has a, uh, uh, an XGA camera, um, runs at 100 hertz, um, and it can track four blobs of light. So uh, when you play with the V, there's a sensor bar at the top, uh, which is which is actually not sensor bar, it's an emitter bar. So you have the bar at the top, which has, I believe, uh, four LEDs. Uh, and then when you're playing with your remote here, there's a camera that's looking at these guys, and it's just tracking the four points. And that's how it knows um, where you are with respect to this calibrated four points. And because I IR, you may have some examples where people remove the sensor bar and just put a cam, for example. And I think that's uh, near IR. Uh, but to me, it was really amazing because this is completely wireless. So they have to do all the processing on board of these four points. And they have to transmit it back over uh, Bluetooth or whatever color wireless, wireless channel they have to the to the to the V box in real time at 100 hertz, uh, and you know you can buy the whole system for again just tens of dollars. Um, and the fact that they were able to integrate sufficiently um, sufficiently um, uh, sophisticated processing uh, was just amazing. And so uh, Johnny uh, Johnny Lee from CMU, uh, he was working with me on some projects I'll show you later on. Uh, really exploited this this uh, emerging platform for, for imaging. And he said, okay, let's use this camera uh, to do lots of uh, interesting things. So, you know, he uses 
is a big star camera chip that does. So it's not transmitting back a whole XJ image back to the base station. Right? It's just transmitting the coordinates of those four points. And that's what makes it very low bandwidth communication. If you're transmitting all the things, that's what it's And a similar trick is also used in the Wicon motion capture that we have in third floor and fourth floor, where you have a uh, high-speed camera that's emitting IR light, and then you have a retro reflector uh, that's, uh, that's reflecting back at the point. Except in this case, you may have an image that's 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, uh, but again, you look at just the blocks, and you buy the binarization and send only the coordinates of the stars. That reduces the bandwidth. Um, so, you know, Johnny Lee, I'm sure he's seen a lot of his demos where he, you know, created a smart board sort of uh, remote and, and, and he changed, you know, uh, he added clickers to it and some really interesting things he's done. He uh, even added uh, 3D tracking because now this V mode, which he's putting over here, is basically a camera and you know where you are in 3D. Okay, then we looked at this multi-flash camera. Uh, the one trick I didn't mention was you can use colored lights. So previously we saw that using multi-flash camera you can get very high quality contours, which are ideal for uh, for uh, gestural interactions. Uh, but you can you know actually use three lights at the same time. So the shadows are cyan, magenta, and and yellow, depending on which color is not dark, um, and then single shot. So just by displacing the lights with respect to the main camera, uh, you have a very robust. Uh, All right. Uh, then we have these techniques where we are not looking at the coordinates, the transform between a camera and a point, but we are looking at a transform between. Uh, a camera and a fixed pattern. Okay. So this uh, Anato pane and, uh, has a camera which is very beautifully designed because it's it's really close to the pen um, and it's looking at the patterns that are uh, encoded uh, in in, uh, in IR ink. So it can, it can be printed on you can print on top of it a document. Uh, but because usually carbon is transparent to near IR, um, this, this particular dots, dot patterns that I have printed can be still seen through uh, with this pen. Uh, and uh, the way they do that is they simply displace these dots from a uniform grid, and that gives them basically a one by one encoding. So a six by six encoding for them uh, apparently is sufficient to create to do the 36 cores, yeah, 36 dots, so 36 uh, bits. This particular diagram seems to say there are more, but um, and then uh, so if you if you print something that occupies about half the US, uh, they can provide unique coordinate to every point in this 1600 kilometers by 1600 kilometer region. So you can print a lot of paper and every 6 by 6 block on this paper is completely unique. So the camera will take a look, take a picture of this pattern, decode what that 36 uh, bit ID is uh, and record that and then if you just move your pen on, on top of this uh, printed pattern, you will know what trajectory you can follow. Uh, it's a pretty amazing idea. I believe they have a lot of patterns <laughs> in this space. Um, and, um, and of course, the, the pen not just tracks where it is, but it can also write. <laughs> um, sometimes you forget basic functionality of our devices. <laughs> a pen that can write. Um, and of course, they have other, uh, other tricks such as uh, Bluetooth, so that you can just write it on a pen and give the pen aside. All the, uh, all the uh, trajectories have been saved. 
all you know is how the fuck you're going to transfer to your ship. I think it's a very, very powerful idea that you can encode a pattern uh, in a fixed uh, flat piece of object uh, and be, you need to be able to uniquely identify it uh, with a real time camera. Building a camera like this is almost like building a microscope. Right? And the problem with that is the depth of field is going to be very narrow in the order of focus. Like a microscope, if you if you tilt the if you shift the dial a little bit, everything goes out of focus. So this camera does have a problem. So they they're, they're engineered it well enough so that you know most of the time the pen is looking straight down. But when it's tilting, the distance between the the camera and the and the, and the pattern is changing a little bit. And there's some key stoning and so on. So they have engineered it well enough so that Um, all these all these problems of looking at binary patterns and be able to uh, deep blur them is you know we we will see that in, when we talk start talking about coding and code exposure and so on. Uh, it's very very interesting because uh, Kevin I think he brought one of the popular uh, iPhone barcode. Uh, popular amongst a few people. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, decoding software, and they, you know, everybody always complains that oh, it has to be out of focus. If it's out of focus, it's uh, difficult to decode and so on. But mathematically speaking, um, if you know that the image that they have captured is binary, then you can let it blur significantly, and you can still recover the original binary pattern. Yeah. Okay. If you give me an arbitrary photo and blur, it's difficult to de-blur and get back the original photo. But if it's a binary image, very easy to go back and recover uh, the truly pattern. And so a lot of these techniques are expert in that. I still haven't seen an iPhone app that actually exploits smart image decoding to recover, you know, binary features, whether it's text or labels and so on. So somebody needs to implement that. There is one yeah, it's like the third most popular data in capture right now, and all it is is a one D market scanner, but it works really well. But but again, you have to be sharp focus. It does a little bit of I forget the name. Is it uh, red laser? Yeah, red laser. Uh, but it still requires sufficiently. It is something sure. Yeah. I don't know. Well, obviously, I don't know. Exactly. So this, this is the challenge with you know a lot of this ad hoc efforts that they are not thinking about the whole problem, the whole pattern. If they just realize the type of they can just study the type of blur uh, an iPhone camera produces. And then write the very software that's suitable for the camera, they'll get much better performance. So I, you know, I really feel like starting my own, writing my own app and just implementing this, at least for myself. Because it will not be very well engineered, but I just can use or you know, take a photo of the camera and notes and so on. So when we come to the coding, you'll, you'll see that how all these techniques are extremely powerful. So optical mouse, of course. Um, 20 by 20 pixels, 9600 frames per second. So the camera you have on your mouse is this 10,000 hertz camera. Uh, and I took it from the STM Electronics uh, manual, um, and its resolution is 800 counts per inch. Okay, so it's, it, even if you shift a little bit, you can detect uh, the variation. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, it can deal with motion blur up to 40 inches, uh, 40 counts per, oh, yeah, 40 uh, inches per second, right? Uh, it's just amazing, all the, all the specifications of how beautiful this whole thing has been, uh, whole thing has evolved. Um, another very popular problem in, in uh, SCI is being able to track the gaze of an eye. So head tracking is easy, uh, but if you keep your head steady and just uh, move, your, move your gaze, uh, it's quite challenging. And so there are several solutions. I, I, this is one of the problems that's still not solved uh, as well. Most of the solutions they have are active, so that you know, 
illuminate the illuminate some higher light and look at basically the reflection of that bright light using the camera. And if you move your gaze, the reflection will appear at a different place. You can think of your eye as basically a shiny sphere. And as it moves around, uh, the reflection of that bright spot changes and from that in a retrograde way. So there are fatigue issues because um, basically we're looking at a bright light source all the time effectively. Uh, to be able to do that. And Another problem with gaze tracking is that uh, because of circuits and because of blinks, uh, it's very difficult to predict. Uh, you need a bit of the camera because your circuits are moving very fast. Uh, and there are also the motions are discontinuous. Uh, so you cannot just put some simple smoothing filters to figure out what the trajectory would be. So these are very interesting problems. And if you do have a really lightweight uh, gaze tracking um, solutions, uh, then this will completely transform how we think about uh, interacting with machines. You know, I can just sit there and try with my eyes because wherever I'm looking, you know, I want to go. Of course, if there is you know, some interesting distraction, uh, that would be a problem. But, uh, but you can imagine in, in non-critical, non-threatening uh, scenarios, this would be extremely long uh, Because we get tired speaking, we get tired um, uh, typing, um, you know, the lot of fatigue issues, but with the gains, uh, you can do a lot of things. Uh, all right, so let, let me show one last one and then we'll stop. So thermal IR motion detectors, I, I really love that because the principle behind it is so simple uh, and it works so beautifully. Um, you know, those uh, thermal detectors is, is basically a one pixel camera it's able to detect uh, a motion of an object. It's just one, actually, to be fair, two pixels. Okay. So something that opens the door for you or turns on the, turns the light on and off uh, and so on. It's just two thermal pixels. How does it work? Um, this is a, a nice cartoon. Uh, let's say each of those uh, two pixels, the bioelectric sensors here, have an aperture that's looking at very narrow regions. Uh, as as the some warm body, because it's looking at body heat or black body radiation, uh, moves through the space. First, you will trigger this detector, and then you'll uh, trigger this detector. The second. Now, if you didn't have this differential measurement, and then by the way, the output of that is just the difference between the two. So in the beginning, uh, let's say the first one gets a spike, but the second one has no signal, so the difference is positive. When the warm void is in the middle, the difference is back to zero. Uh, when the warm void is here, this one is positive, this one is negative, so the difference is, uh, sorry, this one is, this one is a signal, this one has no signal, so the difference is negative. So if something moves in front of this, you get this um, signal that has a very high frequency variation in time. On the other hand, if just the temperature in the room increased uniformly, okay, it's, it's looking at black body radiation. So all the black bodies in the room will you know, also start radiating, uh, radiating energy at uh, thermal IR frequencies. But then both of them will, will increase by the same factor. So the difference between the two will remain constant. And so this is a very simple way of uh, eliminating any slow changes and picking out only the fast moving changes. So this is a simple cartoon, but in, in, in general you have a much more, much more complicated configuration where you have uh, a Fresnel lens usually in front of this detector and instead of just two zones, each of them actually look at a, 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 um, an overlapping fan of zones. It says go from zone A to zone B to zone A to zone B, you're going to get you know, very high variations uh, in this, uh, in this uh, output. Although again, it's filtered and it's simplified, uh, but you can easily distinguish it from an increase in the DC level. So that's how 
you know, a thermodynamic approach. It's basically a one pixel camera because output is just one screen. Although it's in sense with computers. Um, so think about how you can build. This is a basically a coded aperture. It's a smart aperture that's allowing you to use just a single detector to do uh, measurement of motion. Not intensity, but motion. Uh, and many animal eyes also use the same exact motion. They have just a few photo detectors, but by using a clever aperture. Any questions here? All right, I'll send out the, the third assignment later tonight or, or this weekend. And remember, your second assignment is not due today, but it's due on Tuesday. Uh, and feel free to ask me questions or, or uh, Professor Mukagawa or uh, Professor Aluviera and also Ankit. And uh, we'll be happy to help.